Boom. Hey, you're on Lunch Conversations with Randy and Teddy. And those who don't know, I'm Teddy and the gentleman use that word loosely there mm -hmm. and on the screen is my good buddy <laughs> randy wooden our special guest today is dr jenny byrne we'll introduce her to you momentarily we'll let you know that uh lunch conversations with randy and teddy is sponsored in part by blackwell captive solutions they're all about health care planning for corporations who uh predominantly are self-insured for their employees health care if, if your healthcare plan is your biggest span, and for many companies it is, then you may want to talk to Blackwell Captive Solutions about having more power and greater transparency over the cost of that plan so you make sure that you're paying what you should be paying and spending the right kind of money and creating a shock absorber against those big uh, planes that come in. Blackwell Captive Solutions. BlackwellCaptive.com. If you're a self-insured business doing healthcare insurance for your employees, reach out to Carrie and her team and let them know that Teddy said hello. I think I did it, Randy. Sounds good. I think I got all, I'm all my ducks in a row. I'll let you finish up. For those who have sure. never met me, I'm a LinkedIn strategist, trainer, and coach. I teach business professionals how to use LinkedIn as a business tool. We do one-on-one -on -one coaching, corporate training. We have webinars, seminars. Uh, I have a, a Teachable Academy, a YouTube uh, channel, rich in LinkedIn content. And for the right dollar, I'll stand on a street corner and prostatize is the word I've been playing with lately about the power of using LinkedIn as a business tool. Hey, Randy, do you have your ducks lined up? I do. I think we're ready to roll on Facebook and LinkedIn. So what show number 160. Yeah, dude. Is about to get started. Randy Wooden with Goodwill Industries of Northwest North Carolina, director for our professional center. Yeah, we have a professional center. Not a whole lot of Goodwills really have those around the country. But if if you or maybe somebody you know, maybe has a degree or has been in a, a leadership role or aspires to one, reach out, get on the calendar. We're free, happy to help uh, and have clients all across the country, but mostly here in the triad. But yes, every week I get together with Teddy, and Teddy has looks like uh, what are you on the ninth hole or something there in your the this golf is the course? The nineteenth hole, Randy. Or the nineteenth hole, where the kegerator is. I got you. Well, every week we get together and bring in a, a guest and have an interesting topic and discussion. So this week is is no different. So I'll keep an eye on the the chat. Uh, if you've got mm -hmm. comments or questions for our guest, uh, I'll keep an eye on that and work them in where I can. But Teddy, why don't you get us started and we'll get the show on the road. Yeah, absolutely. So our mm -hmm. special guest today is Dr. Jenny Byrne. She's the founder and CEO of Constellation PLLC. She's also the chief patient officer at Belong Health. And I love that name. Uh, Jenny's been referred to often as the triple threat uh, because of not only she's a, a physician leader and healthcare executive, but she's also an entrepreneur. Uh, I love the fact that uh, Jenny focuses a lot on the brain and behavior special and being a behavior specialist. Jenny, would you introduce yourself to our audience, please? Hey, it's so nice to be here. So nice to be with your audience. Um, yeah, thank you for that lovely introduction. As you mentioned, I am a physician by training. I'm also a scientist by training and have a PhD in neuroscience. Uh, my specialty area is psychiatry and psychotherapy. So as you can tell, I'm pretty obsessed with brain and behavior. And that has led me into a bunch of interesting career paths, including some entrepreneurship and uh, executive leadership. So it's really lovely to be with here. And I appreciate the help that you provide through coaching because I have benefited from coaching many times in my life. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Jay. My wife says I need to know more people like you. But I think she wants me to be a patient, not just a patient. Oh, <laughs> that's another conversation. <laughs> For another day, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so, Randy, do you want to hit Jenny with the question? Oh, yeah. The, I always ask the why question. I mean, you, just, you didn't just maybe wake up one day and say, I think I'm going to be a triple threat. So <laughs> I'm sure there were instances or experiences you've you've encountered along the way that said, you know what, this is where I need to be. So I always ask the why question. So uh, what's your why? So my why is that I have really followed my curiosity. So I love to learn. I'm very curious. I like people. I like to know what mm -hmm. makes people tick. And my career has been kind of meandering path 
And it's a lot of saying yes. And I really love connecting the dots for people in new and unexpected ways. So when I'm talking with someone and I see that little light bulb aha mm -hmm. moment, you know, that's what I really live for. And I like to apply that in a lot of different ways around healthcare innovation, but also individual coaching. Um, and then just kind of society at large, healthcare is a little bit of a hot mess and yeah. there's a lot of work to do. Yeah. You know, that word meandering, a lot of people look at that term in the context of business and a career and they think it's could be a problem. I think that there's another way to look at that. And because if you just try to stay on a straight line, life may not be as much fun. And you, and you won't discover stuff that like, oh my God, I can do that. Right. So I, I'm with you. I often in my mind, Jenny referred to it as managed meandering. I, I like that. I think I, if you have a, it's good to have a North star, but know that the path meanders around that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So, so the conversation we're going to have today is uh, originally we were calling it, calling it work smart. And it really is a, a, a lot of what we're going to talk about is how to work smart, mm -hmm. but it's not just working smart, but it's also paying attention to what's going on, paying attention to the world, to the tools, to ourselves, so that we pay attention to where, what's the future of work for us? What's the future of, uh, of life in the context of work for us? So let's, let's play a little bit around uh, work. And one of the things that you and I um, chatted about and I told you I'm a big fan of it. And you you sort of giggled a little bit when I said, uh, Jenny, I love multitasking. I mean, even right now, I'm having a conversation with you and I'm chatting with my broker and, you know, I'm, I'm doing the work I need to do for the show and I'm being a little facetious. But multitasking, we all think that that is a skill set that we need to master. Why do you say that could be a big mistake? Well, Teddy, I'm really, 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 really sorry to tell you, but multi <laughs> multitasking is a myth. So your brain does not multitask. Your brain will rapidly shift back and forth between a variety of things. And when you do that, it is wildly inefficient. <laughs> so unfortunately, when you say you're multitasking, what you're really doing is bouncing back and forth between a variety of things. And your brain is requiring extra energy, extra glucose. Every time you bounce, you're eating up some of your own brain energy and productivity. So if you're doing one thing at a time, you're giving 100% of your energy to that. As soon as you're doing two things at a time, you're giving 40% to each of the tasks and you've lost 20% to shifting. If you do three things at one time, each of them get 20% and you've lost 40%. So multiply that times your email and your Slack and your phone and the dog and all the other things you're trying to multitask. And you can mm -hmm. see how it's actually wildly inefficient and it's a big waste of time. So I'm really sorry to break it to you. There's a reason your brain likes to do it, but it's actually really inefficient. No, I'm, I'm with you. I'm being facetious. I absolutely know from personal experience. Now, I don't follow Dan's thought. Dan <laughs> says he likes to commit his mistakes in sequence. But mm. I do know that the, the more focused I am on a task and the more I turn off those freaking distractions, the more I enjoy it. And the more I create success, um, I, I can picture for me, Jenny, and I, I just did this not too long ago. Um, what's today? Randy, today's Wednesday. On Monday. Monday, I had to do a new, I had to put together a new slide deck. Hate slide decks. But there were, there were <laughs> actually three letter slide decks. And I, I turned everything else off and I brought mm -hmm. to the screen one web browser window, one yep. freaking window. And um, I cranked it out. Yeah, it was it was far more rewarding and, and exciting for me because I did it and I and I got done. I'm like, damn, I'm good. 
Uh, but so it's much faster than you thought, right? Sometimes getting things yeah. done, you surprise yourself. Yeah, but I missed that joke. It was on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, Teddy, there is a, a question here from from Tammy regarding this. Uh, she's asked, does or can multitasking contribute to or maybe cause ADHD? Is that oh, great are they related question. somehow? Yeah. Great question. So I actually, Tammy, I'm a specialist in ADHD clinically. That's one of my favorite areas to work with. So I love talking about ADHD. So ADHD stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, which is actually a terrible name, but that's another story. Um, it's a condition, it's probably a neurological variant. So people with ADHD, their brains are actually probably wired a little bit differently. And that's not neither good nor bad. But what happens if you have ADHD brain wiring in our modern world, distractibility becomes a big problem. Yeah. So the multitasking and the task shifting does not cause ADHD, but for people with ADHD, it's particularly difficult. It creates a lot of problems for them, but it may make you feel like you're ADHD when you're trying to multitask because you're really not focusing your attention. So you may feel like somebody who has ADHD, even though your brain isn't really wired that way. Yeah. Mm, good. Yeah. My wife is a preschool teacher. She works for four-year-olds and she's a trained preschool teacher. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and she knows that in her classroom, you cannot have a bunch of uh, stuff that will distract these kids. Uh, whether they have ADHD or not. And right. she also knows in my office, I shouldn't have a bunch of stuff that distracts this kid. Because that, you know, no matter where you are on uh, in that realm of ADHD or not, mm -hmm. stuff that distracts you can really make it painful to be successful. Teddy's opinion, not based on medical. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, uh, by the way, yeah, this, uh, any other questions or thoughts, throw them out here. Uh, because Randy and I spare no expense to bring smart people to the show. We want them to provide value for you. Is that the right words, Randy? I like it. So, I like it. So, so, Jenny, we also talked about something that I told you that I absolutely love doing, but I think I'm a little bit of a freak. Mm -hmm. Not everybody can do like Teddy. And and I don't know if I use this word, phrase with you or um, another guy I had my third or fourth Zoom call on this morning with. I said, I love talking with people through the dot. And most people don't. Right. Most people, you get in a Zoom meeting, you get into a Zoom webinar, and you want to get out. And if you, after you do your third or fourth in a day, you are exhausted. Yep. W what causes that? And do you have some thoughts or ideas of how you can help people who struggle with it? Yeah, this is a great topic that's so relevant right now and you call people call it zoom fatigue there's actually a technical term for it which is video conferencing fatigue or vc fatigue and research has been done so we know that vc fatigue is real and it has to do with the way our brain processes the information that we're getting from a video conferencing or a zoom call yes. so Part of, you know, we talked a little bit at the beginning about multitasking and brain energy, glucose, right? That's what our brain uses. So here's why it's so exhausting for your brain to be on video conferencing. First of all, we have specialized neurons in our brain called face cells, and they are specifically designed to recognize human faces. They are also designed to look at the interactions between people. So if I'm looking at a couple people, I'm, I'm looking at their eyes and I'm trying to look back and forth to see what their relationship is. So if you can imagine you're on a video call and maybe you have that, I call it Hollywood squares, but maybe that's dated. It's the gallery view, you know, where you have a bunch of people mm -hmm. and your eyes are looking at all these faces, the, the, um, eyes aren't making direct eye contact with you because of the way the cameras were set up. The people aren't looking at each other because of the way it's set up. And it's very distressing to your brain. It's very confusing and distressing. So your brain is trying to figure out who to look at and what it all means. And it's exhausting. 
So one of the reasons you're so fatigued is that your face cells are getting activated in a very confusing way. Another reason it's so exhausting is if you are like most people, you keep on your self view. So you see a little picture of yourself when you're talking. And we have cells in our brain called mirror cells. And guess what? It's impossible not to look at yourself when you're on camera the same way that if you walk down the hall, it's almost impossible not to look at yourself in a mirror. So that looking at yourself and a strange image of yourself is also very distressing and exhausting for your brain. So you got the face cells that are all confused. You've got the mirror cells that are all confused. And then you have the fact that video conferencing is missing a lot of the body language that you typically have. And most people sit too close to their monitor so if I come close, for example, right, like you see a giant head, that's very abnormal. You don't walk into a conference room and go like this and sit a foot away from everybody while they're speaking. Now, now some people do, but that's a whole other conversation. Well, that, yeah, that is another conversation, but it's very exhausting to be in that mm -hmm. abnormal where you, you only see from the neck up. So you're missing all the body language. Yeah. And so it's very tiring to try to understand the body language when you're only seeing this little bit of a head that's like way, way, way too close to you. So those are a couple reasons. Uh, I could give you more, but those are, I think, some of the biggest reasons why you feel so exhausted um, at the end of all these calls. And, and I, I like that. I, I sometimes uh, Zoom, by the way, ladies and gentlemen in the audience, if you're on a Zoom meeting or you're a panelist on a Zoom webinar, in the upper right-hand corner, there is the view button and you can turn off or, uh, yes. what's the word? let me say the right word, you can hide self-view. Now, I don't always do it because I'm so glamorous and I want to see myself, but I've gotten to the point where I've done it a little more often, Jenny, and I will tell you, it does reduce a little bit of the pressure on me or the work I have to do because I worry about how I look. Oh, do I need to sit over here? Or do I need to sit here? You know, do I need to be here? And I'm like, mm -hmm. how important is that? So I'm with you. Turn off self-view. But every time yeah. Teddy walks by a, a mirror, he does need to stop and make sure he still looks good. Well, there's there's that. Another thing too is just the, from tired eyes staring at a screen all day. I mean, that's going to yeah. wear you out. That's a whole other topic too. But what that yeah. does to your eyes and it gets blurry or whatever so maybe it's old age i don't know i'm, I'm teddy uh you'll get there one day if you're lucky i'm, I'm already there <laughs> but that's another issue too but you make some good points about the the body language and not being able to to kind of i'll say gauge the room if you walk into a right. room you see all those relationships going on and so our mind i'm guessing here is trying to play catch up and trying to play catch up to see what am i missing how can i get what I, I need without being able to see what I would normally see in person. So maybe we're, m our mind is playing catch up while we're also trying to carry on conversation. So that's tough, especially for people of limited, uh, you know, capacity, like. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, um, <clears throat> I saw a, um, a lady speak. I uh, just did a recording. And mm -hmm. she was standing in the middle of the room. So you had the, um, uh, I know this lady's name is, can't remember it. And she, very, she, she ran on the show, I think, Randy. And so she was standing in the middle of the room. And it was, a, you know, just a picture of, a, you know, image of video image of a room. And I'm like, I like that style. Now, mm -hmm. I don't think you could always do that. But it was a little different than just simply a talking head. And, and I, I would wager, based on I know that when I'm standing, I deliver better, Teddy, mm -hmm. um, and I'm not standing today. But again, I guess the word I'm trying to think of is I, I like the idea of turning off my self-view. And I also like the idea of make sure you're comfortable when you're doing your Zoom meetings or your, you know, your WebEx meetings, your Microsoft Team meetings, your Go to meeting. If you're not comfortable, then it, it's going to make it uh, more tiresome. There's another thing that I just recently saw as well, Jenny, that, that I need to explore more. I went to a trade show recently and they were, this one booth was handing out glasses. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, they got sunglasses. They were really nice looking glasses. I don't have them. Um, they weren't reading glasses. I thought they were sunglasses. Well, it turned out they were, I think, blue blockers. Yeah. And, and they said, these are great if you're staring at a screen all day long. Have you ever experienced those? or? Yeah. So, so basically what the blue blockers do is they block out certain wavelengths of light in the blue spectrum. And the reason that that can be helpful is um, blue light can activate our body to control our melatonin system, Mm -hmm. which is what it helps control our sleep wake cycle. So the best benefit of the blue light blockers is in the evening. You know, humans weren't designed to be looking at light, you know, midnight or whatever, and then trying to go right to bed. We're designed to have sunlight. And then when the sunlight goes down, you know, we're designed to like go to sleep. So the blue blockers, I mean, actually you really should try to avoid looking at screens in general a couple hours before bed. But if you have to, as many people do, um, putting the blue blockers on in the evening with your screen can help tell your brain, okay, it is evening. It's time for that melatonin to start to kick in so that I can get sleepy and fall asleep at a normal time. You know, these are blue blockers. Uh, they are. And I don't there know a big difference necessarily. I mean, greens look green and blue looks blue. And so is it something that's kind of indiscernible? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And phones, a lot of the uh, smartphones have a um, filter that you can also do a, a shift, a blue shift. They call, I think they call it a red shift where you block yeah. out the blue light at certain times of the day so that if you look at your phone, you're not getting as much. I think it's still better not to look at the screen, honestly, but if you have to, and some people have to, if you do some of these tips and tricks, it can help reduce the strain. So, you know, anything you can do, all these are little things, but but if you can do a bunch of little things, you know, then it it helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm with you. And Jenny, I know firsthand three nights a week, uh, I partake of um, a craft beer and a cigar. And I watch a Netflix movie or I read a book on the outside on the patio. I'm not allowed to smoke in the house. And that's a good thing. So anyway, I know on those nights, and it may be a combination, doctor, Mm -hmm. of the beer, the cigarette, Mm -hmm. and the iPad, that I don't go to sleep as easily. Well, you just did a couple things there. You gave yourself some nicotine, which is a stimulant. You gave yourself alcohol, which, which disrupts your deep sleep. And you looked at a screen which turned on your blue light. So you kind of set yourself up for that one, unfortunately. I'm going to ditch the iPad. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that'll help a little bit. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm with you absolutely right there. So, but, but again, these are, I, I do know for a fact that I strive, even if I go out and watch a book or read a book or watch a movie, mm-hmm. I don't go straight to bed. I come in the house, I spend another half hour, 45 minutes doing other things. And, um, but it definitely has an impact on me. And one other point about uh, a screen fatigue, two things that I think uh, could be beneficial. Number one is use a dark screen on your on mm-hmm. your desktops instead of a bright white. Um, and the next time I go get my fancy Dan glasses, Randy, I'm gonna talk, about, I'm gonna ask them about putting that blue blocker on it. So, and there, there are a couple go. other tips I would just say too, like you were saying with the body language, a simple tip is to make sure you're more than an arm's length back from your monitor. Yeah. So when you're doing like right now, you know, I'm more than an arm that will help my body language loosen up because I don't feel trapped in the box. So that's a simple thing you can do. Turn off the gallery view. If you're the host of a meeting, tell everybody, Hey, we're going to come on for five minutes to say hi. And then after that, I invite you all to go off video while we share this presentation together. We'll come back on at the end. Um, there's a lot of things like that you can also do to kind of, and, and please give yourself breaks between meetings. I don't know, you know, don't set the default on your calendar to 30 minutes, set it to 20 minutes and take a 10 minute break. Like it really adds up. I'm, oh, I'm with you. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, between, I'm a Calendly guy. Yeah, I live and die by my Calendly. There's a there's a minimum thirty minutes between every session. Otherwise, right. I'm going to suffer absolutely. So, yep. uh, um, let's see. Christy says I don't feel like in meetings that I'm talking. I don't like feeling like I'm talking to a wall when cameras are on. 
I, I'm with you. Jenny, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's a great call out. If you're the presenter, so you, you know, if you're presenting something, you're basically performing. So you're doing a performance for an audience if you're the presenter. So it is hard to gauge your audience's responses when they're off mm -hmm. camera. But I would offer that maybe be on camera for a little bit, but then there are other ways to engage your audience. So for example, you all are using chat today. Engaging your audience with chat can be a great way to keep the cameras off. Mm -hmm. You can do polls. You can even do whiteboards that you write together. You can make people come on and off camera to keep them awake. There's a lot of like performance tips that you can do to kind of gauge how people are reacting. But you know, you think about an artist on stage, it's dark. The auditorium is dark, yeah. but they're still reading the room, right? So think about it as a performance and think about your audience and you know, you're asking them to be on camera. It's tiring for them too. So you're really giving them a gift. If you can find a way to engage them without looking at them, you're kind of giving them a gift as well. It's a very generous thing to do. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Um, it is a, it's a collaborative effort. And when we work together, it's often more enjoyable. And Lisa, I went, uh, I went Kindle uh, because I can carry 10 books with me wherever I go. I just, I enjoy reading from a Kindle. I, I get it. Lisa's going to say the feel of the paper. Mm -hmm. I can already tell by Jenny's smile that she's thinking the same way. Randy, do you have any books? Yep, yeah, I don't have a Kindle, but I have books. Yeah, I'm, play, I'm playing with you, man. Uh, <laughs> but I, I just love the, I uh, the Kindle. Now, I do know in the summer, I don't like reading my Kindle out uh, on the beach because they get hot. That's a whole other issue. And sometimes I might take out my uh, um, uh, paperback book, Lisa. I'm with you. So, um, all right, let's do another one. This one here, Jenny, when we talked about this one, I'm like, I don't know. I I, mm -hmm. I I don't get this this whole idea of how do emojis have a positive effect or impact on our brain. And I'm just going to tell you right here, right now, publicly, uh, as we got three minutes before the bottom of the hour. I'm not a fan of the poop emoji, but Jenny, why do we, why are emojis beneficial? So I'm actually, I was with you on this one, Teddy. I used to yeah. hate emojis. I didn't understand them. I'm a Gen Xer. I didn't get it. I was like, what is, what is going So I'm a complete convert and I'll tell you why I'm a complete convert. So emojis, there's a couple things that are important to know. So emojis, the classic emojis, like the smiley face, for example, that was the first emoji. Those are, are faces, mm -hmm. right? And they express emotions. So laughing, crying, things like that. And remember earlier, we talked about our brains have face cells that recognize human faces. Well, guess what? Our brain responds to emojis the same way it responds to real human faces. So an emoji of smiling, our brain responds the same way as if we had a real human being smiling. So the reason this is really important for communication these days and at work is that tone is one of the hardest things to express in written communication, yeah. right? And you, we've all had horror stories about emails where the tone was just way off the mark and it created a lot of stress and a lot of hard feelings. So when used well, emojis can express tone. So if I say, okay, and I put a thumbs up or a smiley face or a crying face or a cringing face, that can all express a different meaning of that word okay. So it, it adds a richness. You know, we were talking about body language. Emojis are like adding a little bit of body language to a word. Yeah. So that's one way they're really helpful is like tone. Now you all have to agree on what the tone is. A smiley face, most people agree on what that means. But that, that you know emoji of poop for example like maybe not everyone agrees on what that means so if you don't agree on the meaning it can actually make it more confusing yeah. but our brain you know emojis that are not faces but other mm -hmm. kinds of emojis like little book i use a little book emoji for example when i write about my book mm -hmm. or they cue our brain and it's like a shortcut symbols are a shortcut for us to understand so if i'm talking about my book and i put a little picture of a book 
you know, that's going to register very quickly in your brain. So symbols can be a great way to catch people's attention, to do shorthand, to activate and engage in a way that words, we're all like swimming in words these days. So when used well, they can be a wonderful way to engage someone else's brain. We're going to keep this conversation going in a minute, but it's the bottom of the hour. And I want to thank our sponsor for, uh, for all the help they do with us, Blackwell Captive Solutions. Uh, they're good people. Carrie's been on the show before. Um, and, uh, you know, the, again, they're just fantastic people. The way they think, the way they help people is all is great stuff. All about health insurance for businesses, specifically for self-insured companies that have uh, a need. And maybe I don't even know what it medical stop loss captive is. Uh, and but with bottom line, it's all it's called a shock absorber for those high dollar claims. So if you know if your organization self insured for health insurance, you know somebody who is self insured for health insurance for their employees, reach out to BlackwellCaptive.com and have a conversation with them. I can promise you that they can. If you're self insured, they have some ideas that can help you. Um, do that better and save some money. Uh, Jenny, I'm with you. That I'm also a convert. I used to say, no, 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 <laughs> in the world that you'll see Teddy yeah. Burris use an emoji. Right, me too. And I, and I changed my mind and, uh, and I've accepted that they have their place. I think that sometimes some people overuse them, in my opinion. And um uh, um, but I think there's a, there's value in them, as you said. And I think not just in email or text message, but I think they have their they have their space in social media. As I'm a social media strategist, but we have to, as you said, we have to agree to the use of them. And one of the reasons why there are some emojis I don't use is because I realize that there are people who may not agree to the use. Right. Yeah. Right. And you don't want to offend. I mean, and that's what's always hard, but it's really about communication with other human beings and, and where you can agree on those symbols. And then what I like what you're saying in social media is the emojis can also be shorthand for you. Yeah. Right. So, so I use the brain emoji all the time. Cause like I said, I'm obsessed with brain and behavior. So I use brain a lot and that's a little shorthand for me. So it's kind of a little bit of fun at work. You know, I feel like sometimes we're so serious. I'm, I used to be very serious all the time and Sometimes we can have a little fun, you know, a little emoji actually wouldn't kill you. Well, I mean, again, this conversation is about the future of our work. And if, right. you know, if we're doing work the way our parents, my parents did work back in the 1950s, and I'm not going to have fun. Right. That's not for me. And, and also, I realize that I'm, am I on the top of the generation pile for where we are to look at Jenny? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. And so my point <laughs> is that there are other generations that I work with. And if I want to have them be a part of the conversation, or if I want to be a part of their conversation, yeah. then I have to be willing to adjust how I engage. Did I say that right? I think I did. Yeah. I and think so. Yeah. yeah, there was a, a comment or question in the in the chat dealing with interviewing and, and how how do you react to body language that you may find uncomfortable during an interview? I don't know, maybe something like this or how do you how do you well, how do you work through if that? You're, my thought would be is if you're interviewing someone via video, um, you probably need to give them a little bit more benefit of the doubt because they may be very uncomfortable doing video conferencing in a way that mm -hmm. they wouldn't in person. So you know, the crossed arms in person might symbolize, you know, I'm very closed or angry or something, but on video, it may just be symbolizing discomfort. Um, so, so one thought would be, you might need to give a little more grace than usual. The other thought would be, um, we talked about mirroring and mirror cells. Mm -hmm. Some, sometimes to put someone at ease, whether you're the interviewer or the interviewee, if you can subtly mirror what the other person is doing, that will put you immediately at ease with mm -hmm. one another and reduce your stress. So if somebody is like this and, you know, and I can subtly kind of do this, it's actually a bonding mechanism that human beings have. Most people aren't aware that they do it, but if you watch them in a room together, people do that. So you don't want to mimic the other person, but you know, if you can find subtle ways to mirror, like if they sit back, you can kind of sit back a little, that will also help to make it a little bit more comfortable. And I'm with you. I think it, um, 
by the way, I, I just read the studies and I've noticed that mirroring. We, we all yeah. do it and often subconsciously. And I think a good communicator may be a little more tactical about not just being subconscious about it. You know. Yeah, and that's what I mean. Like, so if you, you know, it is a way to put people at ease if done in a subtle way. Yeah, and I, and I also know firsthand that if I'm more comfortable standing or sitting in a Zoom call, uh, I am much more productive and enjoy the conversation way more. Mm -hmm. yeah, so um, uh, uh, I think we're up to date on the chat. So here, yep. let's, let, let's, so let's talk about this because <clears throat> uh, I, I shared this idea with you and you, you came up with a way to have a conversation about it. I think one, one way or other this word came up and it's about empathy. Mm -hmm. and you shared it to me in a way that was a little more, a little interesting because I hadn't really thought about it, but I started to realize that it's real and you referred to it as empathy fatigue. Mm -hmm. And talk a little bit about that in the context of humans engaging, Jenny. Yeah, so we talked about Zoom fatigue, right? This is a different type of fatigue that people now are paying more attention to at work because the last few years were really tough. And managers and bosses are really trying now, I think, to be more empathetic with their teams. And that's a wonderful thing. But what most people don't realize is that empathy has its limits. And even the most empathetic human being cannot be empathetic all the time. And your empathy ability will also relate to how you're doing as a human being. So if I didn't sleep well, if I had my cigar and my you know, alcohol and, <laughs> and my uh, screen and I didn't get such good sleep last night, you know, my empathy may be a little lower than normal. And if my kid is having a problem outside my room at work, or if my commute to the office was really bad, you know, whatever is happening in your life, your empathy level is going to fluctuate. So psychotherapists know this. They train in empathy fatigue. This is why psychotherapists don't typically do 40 hours a week of patients. It's too much. Uh. And when you show up to something where empathy is expected or needed without any empathy, it's terrible. So if anyone's ever gone to a therapist and the therapist didn't seem to give a crap about what they were saying, it's awful. Like, <laughs> it's really bad. <laughs> um, so that may be a big problem. <laughs> well, yeah, but it may be the therapist had a bad day, but, but the, the training is to know that you have limits. And so when you are self-aware of how much empathy you have on a given day, being strategic or tactical about where to use it, you know, which interaction am I going to have today where I need to be as empathetic as possible? Where are some other opportunities? Maybe I don't have to be as empathetic. Who on my team needs the most from me today? And if you're showing up on a low empathy day, that's okay. You know, be kind to yourself and understand that you're human and that's really very normal. Um, so I feel like people don't understand that. And so then they on zoom calls all day long, they're trying to just exude empathy through the camera for eight hours a day. And it's just not working. And then it comes across as inauthentic. And, you know, that's not what you want. You're really trying to do the right thing. But if you try to just be empathetic in an unnatural way, it's going to come across the wrong way and kind of backfire. Yeah, I, I get that. I get that. And you just made me think and oh, uh, that, Maybe I have to be um, manage the amount of empathy I share during the day when I know my wife had a bad day at work and she's going to come home and need. Yes, me. exactly. Exactly. Like that's what I say with the kids or the wife or mm. whatever is in your life. You know, you have a limited amount for the day. Yeah. So choose wisely. <laughs> and this is where going off camera can be really helpful because it, you can be on a meeting where you don't have to be on camera. Sometimes that takes the pressure off a little too, where you don't have to be like exuding that empathy through the camera. Yeah. Yeah. Does that, is that also kind of tied in to the amount of sleep that you had? Is Definitely. It yeah. Yeah. In? I mean, yeah. I would say, you know, how your body feels in general. Did you get mm -hmm. good sleep? Did you eat well? Are your relationships good? Are you moving your body? You know, all those kinds of self care things. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't take care of your body, it's, it's going to show, I mean, honestly, like 
people think it doesn't show, but it, it's it's going to show. It it shows in lots of ways. <laughs> yeah. yeah. As she started this whole segment off about my beer and cigars. <laughs> <laughs> No, but Teddy, that you should enjoy that beer and cigarette or cigar. You should just enjoy the heck out of that thing, you know? And then maybe that means the next day you're not going to have 100% empathy. Maybe maybe you don't schedule as many meetings. Maybe you do something else to take care of yourself, right? It's all about well, no, like I, I, no, I understanding. Get you. I, I absolutely get you. I mean, there are some habits that you have to manage those habits. I, a good friend of mine posted he's alcohol free for 15 years and I celebrate with him. I mean, I is so freaking fantastic. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who can't manage some of the things that other people can manage differently, but we have We're to be all human. Yep. I think, again, it's all about knowing yourself, knowing the people you work with mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. accepting the fact that we're all human. We all do stupid human stuff together. Yeah. You know, I'm human. I do plenty of stupid human stuff all the time. Randy, have you ever done any stupid human stuff? Uh, how, we don't how, have back, time, how, right? back are, how far back are we uh, expected to confess to here, Teddy? I, I, alphabetically or chronologically, you, you take yeah, your pick, so, right? But I get you. I think it's, uh, yeah. it's a, a great uh, conversation for us to have with ourselves about you know empathy fatigue and 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 knowing mm -hmm. where we can be empathetic knowing where we know we're not going to be uh you i think you used the word sincerely empathetic or a phrase like that uh and and if we're not we need to understand that about ourselves because empathy is a powerful life tool yes we have to have it and we have to know when we can do it uh, effectively appropriately yeah so uh, so randy if, if Next time you and I are talking, I tell you, yeah. I don't give a crap. It's probably because my wife had a bad day, and I now know that. that you're, that's your story, and <laughs> I'm going to stick stick to that story. That's a good one, Teddy. Uh, this hey. is, uh, Jenny, this is really good. I appreciate yep. these ideas, these conversations. All right. When 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 you and I last talked, I um, you said, you used the word traditional office culture, and then you yes. qualified that, and you said pre-pandemic. And we have these mindsets of what a traditional office culture looks like and feels like. Yes. But this is not necessarily where our future is going. You know, the workspace and the way we work. I mean, look at this. Randy and I have a thriving business where I, we talk through the dot, you know, uh, and yeah. it's, it's not the traditional office. So talk a little bit about those perspectives and where are we going and and maybe why we have those perspectives that they are the traditional office. Yeah, well, how about, let me do this. I'm going to go down a list of kind of traditional office, as I call it. And then if folks are listening and they want to put in the chat, where do you think all this came from? I'll throw it out to the group and see if anybody knows where all of this actually came from. So some of the uh, key components of the traditional office are working nine to five, Monday through Friday. So the work calendar, um, dry, commuting to a centralized location. So typically commuting, typically driving, going to a centralized building where everybody, oh, okay, we got some ideas popping in there. Okay, I'm gonna keep talking. Um, the idea that the first floor, when you walk into the building, there's kind of an open floor, right? The first floor feels very open. And then as you go up, there's kind of an, a cubicle area, right? There's like a, a open cubicle area in the middle of the floor. And then there's offices that ring those cubicles. And then typically the more important you are, the bigger title you have, you go up and up on the floors. And the most important person is typically sitting up in the corner office on the top floor. Don't be hating on me, Randy. <laughs> so I saw one idea in the chat there. Yeah. I don't know if anybody else has an idea where this came from. Yeah. So these are all assumptions about what an office. Oh, Dilbert. Mm, interesting. <laughs> Lisa. It was actually before Dilbert, but I saw someone about, else put. What yeah. about like uh, pyramids and stuff in Egypt where, you know, the. Yeah, at the lower level of the pyramid is where all the worker bees are. 
Good idea. Whatever, and you you move higher up, and you know you've got the pharaoh or whatever sitting at the at the top. Well, I don't know. Actually, in that case, the it was cast, the other way around. The because, cast system, maybe I don't know. Because actually, the pharaohs were buried under the pyramids. Believe it or not, yeah, so in that true, case, yeah. it wouldn't actually work. But someone mentioned the industrial revolution. So the answer is that the current traditional office has its roots, yes, in the industrial revolution, but specifically in the Henry Ford factory. Ah. So in the Industrial Revolution, you know, 1800s, working conditions were awful. Children, women, men worked around the clock, you know, 80, 100 hours plus a week, terrible working conditions. So someone had an idea at the end of the 1800s to have a kinder, gentler workplace. And they said, I think people should work eight hours a day. Thus, the nine to five was born, but it wasn't really adapted. It, the idea came at the end of the 1800s. The first person who really adapted some of these strategies was Henry Ford, hmm. because he wanted good labor to come and work on his factory floor, which at the time was revolutionary. He had an open floor plan where he had lines of cars moving along an assembly line, and each worker took a part on that assembly line. Well, you needed managers, right? So he created the idea of these managers. Well, what did the managers do? They ringed the factory floor. They started to have offices that ringed the factory floor. Well, what happens when the factory gets big and you need more managers? You build another floor. Now you have two floors. The top managers go up to the top, the factory managers stay down. Build up, 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 you know, and eventually you get to the workplace that we have today. And we don't have an assembly line. Most places we have cubes. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this was all kind of where it came from. And we knew that this was kind of silly because we had things like office space, the movie, we mm -hmm. had the TV show, the office. Right. And we all laughed and we thought it was ridiculous. And we knew at some level that all these assumptions were ridiculous, but they became but yeah, so, yeah, they became so entrenched in our concept, our mental model of what an office was that we forgot that they were only a hundred years old. Yeah. And before that work was actually very different. So and I get the transformation from slave labor and child labor and hundred hours of work week that um, I don't know if it would, if someone, I'd love to know if you, maybe you do or don't know who was that person who said it before Henry Ford adopted it. You know, what happened to that guy he probably ended up in a ditch somewhere um but but that lifestyle is not it was taylor so right? taylor yeah he was the social he was a sociologist and he took it to the government he wanted the government to create policies that were kinder and gentler it was called taylorism I but got he you. got he got turned down and it wasn't until later in the 1900s where you mm -hmm. had things like you know, the government mandated work hours and overtime, et cetera, et cetera. So it was really like 50 years after he came up with the idea that the government took it on, but Ford took it on earlier. Yeah, the National Relations Labor Board or whatever. It, it, but I get it. Henry Ford was trying to uh, create an environment where he could keep people. because he Exactly. Needed, yeah. Yeah. But but the problem is fast forward, you know, 50 years, 100 years, and everyone's like, I don't want to feel like a robot at work. Well, there's a reason you feel like a robot. Your whole work model is based on humans building cars. Yeah. So it, it's, it, you know, you feel like a cog in a machine because that's exactly where the model came from. Yeah, yeah. And, and today, uh, businesses, I from the stuff that I read and heard and even talked to some business owners, there are still a few who subscribe to Henry Ford's style. Oh, yeah. Um, everybody back to work. Come on, start commuting. And then there are some who are discovering, hey, mm -hmm. this new lifestyle, this new uh, environment of hybrid, remote, uh, people are happier, productivity is up. Let's not screw with it. And I think yeah. it's probably for some people, the traditional offices is the right model. Yeah. The, you know, for some people, that is going to be the right model. And for some people, totally remote work will be the right model. But it's probably about 70% of us, something in the middle. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ted, remember we had Peter Marsh on a year or two ago, and he and his uh, business partner, they do I- I internal architecture I- inside. Yeah. Right. Strategies. Right. yeah. Yeah. They they take care of the, you know, the feng shui or whatever inside the building to help, again, create a different atmosphere. Mm-hmm. They're architects, but they only, they do the internal piece. So that, I don't know if that's something that's catching on more and more. I'm guessing it might be as we look to rethink how we go to work. I think it is for when we're together, but the bigger question that people are struggling with is when should we be together? Yeah. 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 Teddy and I I hardly ever get together. I mean, I can't (laughs) stand the guy, you know, that's all I can do to put up with him for an hour a week on, on on the blue dot, but I'm I'm sure it's mutual. (laughs) So, I mean, the point of this whole conversation is that (laughs) we have traditional thought processes that came out of a whole nother realm, Mm -hmm. um, you know, predominantly generated by a guy who was all about production, production, production and cranking. You know, if you want to, if you can have any color car you want, as long as it's black. And, right. um, <laughs> and and that's not who we are today. It's not what we do. That's not how our societies, our global economic sys- uh, machines are working. And so it's sort of along the lines of we no longer use um, uh, uh, quill feathers as for writing. We've moved on to crayons and pencils and ink pens and chalk and whatever else. So why don't we change the way we do it? Because we yeah. adopted tradition and we struggle fighting tradition. Am I, I think yeah. that's, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so uh, I, I'm a rebel. Um, you'll, uh, I will never forget probably about, I don't know if I told you so or not, Randy, about 12 years ago, I'm in my business. My business is thriving and making multi-million dollars a year in my mind. And I went to talk to a guy and he says, I want you on my team. I want you to be a member of my team. And he said, you can be part-time if you want, but I want you to be a member of my team. And he's introducing me to his team and, you know, introduced me to all the things that people do. And we walk by this cubicle Mm -hmm. and he says, and Teddy, when you're, that's your cubicle. And that was the flag for me. <laughs> it's like for Teddy, I'm not speaking for anybody else, but for Teddy, mm-hmm. that was never going to happen ever again. I didn't need a corner office. Right. I didn't need that, but I knew I didn't want to be in a cubicle. So um, anyway, um, it's just not my style. So traditional culture and that's in, in these traditional cultures are not just the way they're laid out nine to five commute an hour and a half one way for 10 years right. you know, open floor cubicle ring of office it's also the way we engage with each other it's the hierarchy yes. that we, you know that you know you talk to your boss you tell your boss you don't tell the president of the company there's a lot of other traditions that i right. think we're seeing change i mean am i missing any, is there other traditions and Oh, I could get go into a whole, but there's a whole bunch of things around gender and underrepresented groups and equity. I mean, there's so many tangents to this conversation, but again, I think the key is, are we willing to challenge it? Because we've seen the toll it is taking on us as people, our mental health, the toll it is taking on our communities, our kids, our families, you know, I think we're ready. I believe I'm an optimist. I believe we're ready to challenge the assumptions and make it better, especially now. Maybe our robot helpers are getting better. You know, maybe we can do more human stuff because maybe the robots are getting a little bit better. Yeah. A- ask Amazon that question. Um, right. they, they, um, their Amazon, and this is public information. Amazon set one point five billion dollars aside to train their warehouse workers on different jobs, including technology, software development, customer service. And the reason why Amazon is setting that money aside is because they know that quickly they will not need humans in the warehouse. And won't it be great when the humans can do the human stuff, like the empathetic human connection that we all crave instead of just trying to chat with a robot who has no idea what we're saying? Yeah, 
Yeah. So, <laughs> and that term <laughs> chat with a robot who does not know or care about what we're saying could be another human, but that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> could but, be. So uh, good stuff. Oh, uh, Lisa wants to know, do you have a podcast? Yeah. Do you have a podcast? Yeah. Yeah. I do not have my own podcast. Um, if you go to my website, you can see an archive of all the podcasts I've done and my writing and things like that. So my website is my my name, Dr. Dr. Jenny. It. You got I'll, it? I'll share it. Yep. So you can see an archive there. But uh, thank you for asking. No, I don't have a podcast, although I do love being a guest. Maybe I just don't love being a host. Yeah. Yeah. yeah or your newsletters, that kind of thing where you or a blog or something that you put out content. Uh, LinkedIn is the best place to follow me. That's where yep. I'm most active with my content. Um, mm -hmm. And then if you uh, want to get on a, uh, my email list to talk about this topic in particular around my book, Work Smart, um, you can reach out to me and I'm happy to put you on that as well. Yeah, I, I'm sharing yeah. all that so that they can find your book and your, uh, and, oh, great. Uh, and Thank follow, you. You, follow you on LinkedIn. Jenny, I got the, I can multitask, girl. <laughs> so uh, uh this is good so um uh, one more uh let, let's uh let's let's go to this one a little quick because i just ran out of time and it's all my bad why does work suck work sucks because we don't feel like humans at work that's really the bottom line we want to be humans we want to be treated like humans we want to treat other people like humans we don't want to be robots we don't want to feel like our time is owned by someone else. Mm. You know, we just want to be honestly good human beings. And again, I think we can get there. I really do. Yeah. I don't think it's as hard as most people think it is. No. And it does start with you having the desire to be in an environment that you want to enjoy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And work doesn't have to be so horrible and serious. I mean, again, the better the robot helpers, the more I think we can loosen up and have a little fun at work. I, I like her phrase, Randy. We need to find somebody to come talk to us about uh, robot helpers. Ro robot helpers. We need them. Yeah, yeah we need them. So, <laughs> Jenny, if there is one thing that our mm -hmm. audience, who we absolutely love our audience, if there's one thing that you want to make sure they got from this conversation, what is that? Besides robot helpers. That, yeah, robot one. helpers is great. I would say, you know, uh, we're all human. I'm human. You're human. Uh, the audience is human. Everybody is human. So if we can really take that lens to work, a human lens to work, it's just going to feel a lot better. And it does translate it to home, too. You know, when work is better, home is better. So, yeah. you know, I just say, like I said before, I do all the same dumb human things as everybody else. You know, having credentials doesn't matter we all do it it's and you know it's okay it's okay be kind to yourself yeah good stuff i like that be kind to yourself because we are all human so uh good stuff jenny thank you very thank you. much absolutely a this delight to have this chat with you thank you so much for having me i hope that this was helpful for your audience yeah so i uh, absolutely i've uh, already gotten comments and and said mm -hmm. thank you for you being here so randy any thoughts before i Close out with just, uh, just a quick observation that, you know, it's is we get to know each other better or ourselves better uh, and understand some of the why behind why th things may not feel right, uh, mm -hmm. why the fatigue is there, then maybe we can affect change. If, if we can recognize it and understand some of the causes, maybe then we can adjust what we're doing to get a better result. So it's just it's a process. Um, but Again, somebody like you who's kind of on the leading edge of this stuff can point things out that Teddy and I may not think about. Uh, but again, right. you don't know what you don't know. So this is a good this is a good topic. I appreciate you coming on today. It's great. Good stuff. Good. Thank you, Randy. Yeah, yeah. Jenny, thank you very much. So, hey, next week, um, by the way, Randy, don't punch out for lunch because you were a little late this morning. So I don't punch out for lunch today. I want okay. You to keep working. <laughs> Duly noted. Thank you very much. Next week, we have Lee, uh, Leo Liu. Uh, he's going to come have a conversation with us about cryptocurrency. And not just for you to invest in my cryptocurrency, but he's going to talk about applications over speculation. Because that cryptocurrency is not going away, uh, but it's way more than just simply a place to speculate and invest. It's all about applications 
and it's going to keep growing just like chat gpt and, and, and bard does as well uh, so join us next week for uh, leo lu and a conversations about uh, cryptocurrency application over speculation uh, the show is sponsored in part by uh, Blackwell Captive Solutions. We appreciate them being here. They're all about helping organizations, businesses uh, have more ownership, peace of mind, price stability. If you're self-insured for your health insurance, reach out to blackwellcaptive.com and have a conversation with them. Thank you again to our audience for being here. We love you guys all showing up. Jenny, again, grateful to have you on the show randy go forth and help people buddy i'll talk to you later do have a good one see you all right bye